Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Healthcare Safety Network Training for Long-Term Care Facilities Participating in the COVID-19 Module. This is a live training today and it is being recorded. So I just have a few housekeeping rules I want to go over. Please use the Q&A box to type in your questions throughout the presentation. The chat box will be, be disabled. We will do our best to answer your questions as they come in. We do ask that you wait until the end of the session before submitting definition specific questions as I will likely answer those questions for you before the end of the presentation. The slides and the recording will be available on our website as soon as possible, as soon as we can get that closed captioning requirement done. In the meantime, we do have slides other training slides for similar to, to this module training today on our website and we also have the guidance document and with that I'm going to go ahead and get started here for those of you who may be new to the National Healthcare Safety Work Network also referred to as NHSN I want to begin by introducing the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's National Healthcare Safety Network to you. You will hear me refer to this as CDC's NHSN or NHSM. NHSN is a secure internet-based surveillance system that is managed by the CDC. The surveillance system is open to a diverse number of healthcare facilities across the United States that enables, enables various reporting options such as healthcare associated infections, also referred to as HAIs, other things such as adherence to clinical practices known to prevent healthcare associated infections, and more, including the new COVID 19 module. In response to the COVID-19 pandemic, the CDC's NHSN developed a COVID-19 module within the existing NHSN long-term care facility component. Given NHSN's role as a shared platform for healthcare associated infection surveillance, as well as our collaboration with long-term care facilities and partners within the nation, NHSN provides a valuable foundation for COVID-19 surveillance. I do want to remind you that the long-term care facility COVID-19 module was officially released to enrolled long-term care facilities on April 28, 2020. Additionally, at the same time, we had our long-term care facility COVID-19 webpage that was launched, which was open to the public. And this web page provides a wealth of information and a variety um, of useful documents for surveillance and reporting of COVID-19. We do maintain this website and it is updated pretty much daily as new materials become available, including new training dates, new guidance documents, etc. To assist with response efforts, NHSN will share the COVID-19 data with state and local health departments so they will have the information needed to quickly respond and provide resources to the long-term care facilities across the U.S. NHSN will also be the platform for sharing required data elements with the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, also referred to as CMS. Data will also be used by CDC's emergency COVID-19 response teams, as well as the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, also referred to as HHS, COVID-19 tracking system, which is maintained in the Office of the Assistant Secretary of Preparedness and Response. These data will be accessible to you all as individual long-term care facilities, as well as to group users, such as at the corporate level entities, which have multiple long-term care facilities under one umbrella. This includes a data dashboard within the NHSN application, which will allow quick access to analyze data and reports. This is coming soon. It is not currently available. I just wanted to point that out. And lastly, this module does not collect resident level or staff level data. The goals of the long-term care facility COVID-19 module are to better understand the challenges faced by long-term care facilities during this horrible pandemic and to identify the resources that will enable priorities for public health action. 
And this is to protect the vulnerable populations that you all work with, as well as to better meet your needs by having a greater understanding of the staffing and supply availability and our shortages. Long-term care facilities eligible to report data into this module include enrolled skilled nursing facilities and or nursing homes that is considered one facility type. Also assisted living facilities and residential care facilities, as well as intermediate chronic care facilities for the developmentally disabled. Any three of these, sec of these facility types may enroll as the individual facility type into the module or into NHSN, full reporting if you would like. As you probably all know by now, participation in this long-term care facility COVID-19 module does require facilities to be actively enrolled in NHSN with a designated person having access through Secure Access Management System, which is referred to as SAMS. Active long-term care facilities who currently have access to NHSN should have immediate access to the module. If you just take a look on your left navigation menu, you should see COVID-19 tab as an option and you may begin reporting. For those facilities that are not enrolled, you must first register and enroll with NHSN online. And this does include completing the SAMS registration, which is known as our security checkpoint, where the user will be given a, a SAMS login ID, which will be your, your, um, your password, or not, excuse me, not your password, but your email address. And then you'll also be giving, given a temporary password in which you will update to your own password. If your facility has previously enrolled and with NHSN, but is no longer able to gain access for whatever reason, we do ask that you please contact NHSN user support at NHSN at cdc.gov for assistance and include in the subject line, enrollment assistance for previously enrolled long-term care facilities so that you may be uh, triaged to the appropriate person. We are asking facilities to not re-enroll a previously enrolled long-term care facility because this causes many issues, including issues with, uh, with data analysis. Again, I wanted to provide you with a visual of what I consider the main three components to enroll, the main three processes. So again, as I just discussed, first you have to register your facility with NHSN. We have to know who you are. So the way that you do that is you accept the NHSN rules of behavior, and that link is on our LTCF COVID-19 web module webpage under enrollment. And once you accept the rules of behavior, you will complete the NHSN registration process, the online registration process. Within 72 hours, business hours, you should be receiving an email from SAMS No Reply, and that email will give you instructions to register with SAMS. Now, registering with SAMS is a different part. This, again, is our security checkpoint where you are going to be uh, selecting your password as well as answering some security questions so that we know who you are as a person. And then once you complete that, the final process is to enroll the long-term care facility with NHSN. And as part of that enrollment, you will be completing the, as the final step, you will need to accept the NHSN agreement to participate and consent, which once you log in, after you complete SAMS, you should be able to log in on the SAMS website. And from there, you should see a pop-up box or an alert that will guide you through that final process of accepting the NHSN agreement to participate. This slide is really a duplicate of, the, of what I just talked about. I wanted to keep it in my slides because this is what you will see on the LTCF COVID-19 webpage uh, as part of, of the guidance documents. It's exactly the same process, the same steps. This slide just gives a little bit 
uh, more details for you. Here is the link I have been referring to, to the LTCF COVID-19 webpage. Again, from this page, users will see the enrollment section if you kind of scroll down, and that's where you can find more information as well as the steps for enrolling your facility. There are some terms that you may hear me or others refer to when we are speaking about the COVID-19 module that I just wanted to briefly go over with you. One is pathway. So each section in the module is organized by a specific focus and we call that a pathway. So there are four pathways or four specific focuses within this module that I'm going to talk about today. And then data element is the response or the count that you as the user provide to specific questions within the pathway. So basically answers to the questions. This module does have four separate reporting pathways that enable an assessment of the COVID-19 in long-term care facilities. The pathways include resident impact and facility capacity. Next, we have staff and personnel impact. Then we have supplies and personal protective equipment or PPE. And lastly, we have ventilator capacity and supplies. As you open each of these pathways, as I'm going to show you, you will see that the data elements for each pathway include a combination of counts as well as yes or no responses. Here is a list of the topics that are covered across all four pathways. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this slide. I just wanted you to have this in your slide. So these are the data elements that that respond that you will be answering um, as you go through the pathway. And again, we're going to we're going to talk about each of these individually as we move forward. It is expected that users will consistently collect and enter data into the NHSN long-term care facility COVID-19 module. While daily reporting is encouraged, we do understand this option may not be feasible for many of the reporting long-term care facilities. However, long-term care facilities should report no less than one week, and this is really essential to maintain up-to-date data as we need this data for national surveillance and public health response. As previously mentioned, the, da the data elements for each pathway include a combination of count and yes or no type questions. If your facility will be reporting daily, as outlined on, on this slide, the selected calendar date must reflect the date in which the responses and counts are collected and reported. For facilities that are not reporting on a daily basis, including facilities electing to report once a week or more, the selected calendar date and responses to the yes or no questions must continue to reflect that specific date in which date, data are being reported. And I'll go into more detail as we progress through the slides. For questions requiring counts, such as death counts, confirmed case counts. For these questions, you will only report new counts since the last time those counts were reported for that specific question. Okay, so each time you report, you're only reporting the new counts since the last time you reported these data into the module. And we're gonna really go into detail of how this works. But first, I just wanna give you a few surveillance tips Regardless of the frequency that your facility chooses to report data, it is important that data be collected at the same time each day. And this includes weekdays and weekends. You, if reporting once a week, it is important to report out on the same day every week. So for example, if you choose Mondays, report Mondays every Monday or Fridays every Friday. And we do encourage facilities to use a line list or the NHSN data collection forms to document daily counts if you're not going to be reporting into the module daily. Um, this way you have some consistent method 
of collecting your count data so that when you actually sit down in front of the computer to enter these data into NHSN, you have it already in front of you and they've been consistently counted at the same time each day so that your data and your analysis will be consistent for your facility. And this is important also when comparing data at a national level so that we are comparing apples to apples and oranges to oranges. I do want to give you a few updates since the initial training that was provided on this module, we've had some things change and we've received a lot of great feedback from our long-term care facilities and our partners. And as a result, we have made some changes to the, to the module. Uh, so if, the, if, if you have not already started reporting, then these changes aren't really changes to you. But if you have already started reporting, please be aware of these changes. And as, as I approach a slide that is a change, I will be sure to let you know that it is a change or an update. So first, let's talk about reporting counts for the first time in the NHSN COVID-19 module. If this is the first time that you have actually logged in to this module and you're going to be answering questions, okay? So you have not logged in before and you have not answered any count questions. So the very first time you log in to enter data into this long-term care facility COVID-19 module, you will be entering counts based on that week only new counts based on that week. Do not include retrospective counts but that occurred before May 1st, okay? So let's say that I decide that the, I've enrolled my facility and my first date that I'm going to enter data for the very first time into this module is gonna be May 8th, then I'm only going to include new counts since May 1st, so one week, okay? This is very important and, and I'll, I'll continue saying this as we go through the module. So believe me, by the end of this training, you will have this down pat. So don't worry if you're a little bit confused right now. I think by the end of the training, you will have it. You will all be experts and then you can do my job for me. Okay, let's go to the next slide here. So after the first date that counts are entered into the module, and I'm, and I'm speaking of counts, okay? So remember, there's a combination of counts and yes and no type questions. Right now, I'm just talking about the counts. So after you've logged in, you've entered counts into the four pathways, uh, let's say on May 8th, and then let's say you log in again on May 12th. On May 12th, you are only going to enter the new counts that have occurred since you entered data or those counts on May 8th, okay? So you're only reporting the new counts since the last time you reported these counts into the module. And this is very important because our goal is for every time you're reporting counts is to only capture new counts that have occurred since the last time you entered the data. And that's really why it's so important to try to collect the data at the same time every day. Because let's say that at, you collect data every day at 9 a.m. and you document it on, on, your, on your spreadsheet. At 9, 9, 9 a.m., Mr. Smith is being treated as a suspected case, okay? He has all the signs and symptoms, but you have not received a positive lab test. So at 9, 9 a.m., you have not received that positive lab test, so he gets counted as a suspected because, you know, let's say he's new for that week. That's a suspected. The next day, at 9, 9 a.m., you still haven't received the counts, okay? He's still there, he's not, you don't wanna count him as a duplicate, but let's say the next day, maybe the 11th at 9 a.m., Mr. Smith has tested, his results are positive. He'll get counted then as well. So he, he will, for that week, go in as one suspected and one confirmed. 
And that's why it's so important to collect data at the same time every day, if possible. And this just keeps your data consistent. I want to talk a little bit about reporting retrospective counts. And this is an update. Okay, so if a facility would like to submit retrospective aggregate counts, so retrospective total counts prior to the module being released, so prior to, let's say prior to May 1st, there is an option to do this. And again, this instruction has been updated since the initial training. For those of you who have not already entered retrospective aggregate count data based on the earlier guidance that was given, or if you would just like to make edits based on this new guidance, please follow these instructions. So specifically, to submit counts that occurred prior to May 1st, which is what we're considering aggregate retrospective counts, so to submit your accounts that occurred prior to May 1st, you're going to use the calendar feature that I'm going to show you, and you're going to select a calendar date prior to May 1st. And it is there that you will enter the total number of counts for each question that you have count data for that will include between January 1st all the way, all the way to April 30th. If these data are not available, that's okay. You can leave it blank. You can revise later. This is not a CMS requirement. This is not an NHSN requirement. But if you would like to be able to document the morbidity and mortality that your facility experienced prior to this long-term care facility COVID-19 module becoming available, then we're giving you the option to do that. And we would encourage you to do that. Um, and, and, and so you, but you would need to do it independently of data that gets entered from May 1st forward, okay? And I'm going to show you an example of this, so don't worry. Okay, so now that I've covered those basics, which feel like a lot more than basics, but I am going to take you to the fun part. Let's get started with NHSN and how do you report these data? To begin reporting into this COVID-19 module, you will sign in to the NHSN application. Remember, you have to enroll first. So enrolled facilities must log in to the long-term care facility component. And once you are logged in, you will be taken to your NHSN homepage, which will look similar to what you're seeing on the screen. For those of you who are enrolling in just the COVID-19 module, your screen may look a little bit different as you won't see all of the options that you're seeing on this screen, but that's okay because the COVID-19 module is exactly the same regardless of which, which long-term which long-term care facility is reporting and, and which type of access you have. So the first step that you will do is you will click into that COVID-19 box on the left navigation menu. And when you do that, this is what you're going to see, a calendar. And this calendar will default to the current month. As you can see, I know that the screen may be small, but you can see at the top from April, 26th of April, 2000 until June 6, 2000. So before I dive into the module, I do wanna point out some really important features um, of this calendar. Um, so after clicking the module tab and, and you default to this calendar, you can enter data all the way up until the present date. Users may also, uh -oh. What just happened here? Let me go back. Okay, users may also enter retrospective data. So just as I spoke about, if you want to enter the retrospective, the old data prior to May 1st, you have, uh, you can click at the very top left-hand screen, you can click one of these, this back arrow icon here and go to all the way back to January if you want to. So if you wanted to enter your data, your retrospective data by month, all the way back to January 1st, 2020, you can do that. 
or you can just select one day before May 1st and enter it all on that day. It, it's your choice, or you don't have to do it at all. Um, and so the other thing I wanted to show you, actually it's on the next screen. Okay, the next thing I wanted to show you, is, which is a really nice feature built into this calendar, it, that enables you to quick enables a facility to quickly validate if a record is complete or incomplete. So as you can see at the top up here, I have a square around it. For each of the four pathways, if the record is complete, meaning all of the questions in that pathway have been answered and saved, that pathway will be highlighted green. If the record is missing even one question, the, the pathway will be highlighted as like a tannish yellow color. So you can see on this screen that on, is that April 1st, the resident pathway, the supplies and the ventilator, all of those have, all the questions have been answered. But then if you look at the, um, the following day on April 2nd, the, the resident impact pathway uh, for something was left unanswered. So let's, so want to point this out. Again, we're going to go into more details. Another important feature that I want to point out to you all is if you look at the bottom of the calendar, you will see additional reporting options. Data submission options include manual data entry where you actually manually enter the data. You, can, you also have the option for CSV files submitted by individual facilities or bulk CSV file upload for multiple facilities. These options are available at the bottom of the calendar page as you're seeing in the screen here. And then facilities also have the option to export any data that you enter into a table format using the export CSV option. And so these are tabs and you would just click click directly into the tab to and follow the instructions. During today's presentation, I will be focusing on manual data entry. So actually just manually sitting in front of the computer and typing in, in the data. If you are interested in learning more about uploading data or any of our templates, they are all available on our long-term care facility COVID-19 webpage, which I have here. Also, I would encourage you, if you look under facility resources, you will see a facility guide to using the COVID-19 module. That guide is very similar to the slides that I'm presenting today. So I would say not to use both, but either or. Um, if, if the slides work better for you, use my slides. If the facility resource guide is better, use the resource guide. But essentially, you're going to get the same information. Also on that same web page, we do have data collection forms and form instructions for each pathway. And they, they're located, if you scroll down the page under, I think it says data collection forms and instructions, and you will see one for each of the four pathways. These can be particularly, particularly useful for facilities reporting count data in the module once per week because it will allow you to use the forms to collect the counts and then have all the forms, maybe keep them in a folder for the day that you're gonna sit in front of the computer and actually enter the counts. And again, each of these forms and each of the pathways, they have instructions for how to answer each question. And, and I strongly encourage you to, especially until you get used to entering data into, into this module that you use these form or these instructions, we call them table of instructions, but I strongly encourage you to use these table of instructions so that you're understanding and you're interpreting each question the way it is meant to be interpreted. Because the, the question may sound one way to you, but then when you read the instructions, it may be interpreted by NHSN a little bit differently. So I encourage you to please review those instructions prior to entering data. Okay, so now we're moving on to step two. So step one, we logged in, right? We clicked, we got to our calendar, we're right here. So step two, when you are ready to begin entering the data, so your count data and answering your yes and no questions, you're gonna sit in front of your computer, you're gonna log in, you're gonna click on the COVID-19 module, you're gonna get this calendar view, 
and you're going to click in the date for which your facility will be entering data. Okay, so for for this presentation, I will be using May 8th as the date that I would like to answer questions. So I'm going to click in to May 8th. Again, since this is so important, I do want to repeat this. The first time, so let's say today is my first time entering data into this module, May 8th is my first time, I will be entering count data to include my new counts for this week only, okay? So I'm going to include May 1st to May 8th for my count data because today is my very first time entering data into this COVID-19 module. So here we go. So I've clicked on May 8th and this is what, what will appear. A new window will open up and you're going to see all four pathways. The screen will automatically default to the resident impact and facility capacity pathway, but that does not mean that you have to start with that pathway. You could click into any of the four pathways to begin entering data. You may, this, this module gives you a lot of flexibility. You may navigate to and from each pathway during one session. You do not have to save each session individually unless you wanna come back later and enter additional data. Or you can just decide, right now I have 10 minutes, all I have time for is to enter data in one pathway. You can enter that, save it, come back later and, and enter your data later. Um, so there's no right or wrong as far as when you access these pathways, as long as you're meeting your, your reporting requirements, okay? So you can go in more than one time in, in a day. You can go in as many times as you want. You can edit the data that you input. There is so much flexibility. A couple things on this screen uh, I just want to point out. The top at the very top up here, if you can see it, it shows you the date, so 5-8-2020, and then each of the four pathways. So the, the one highlighted is the default. This is what you automatically see. Um, I think that's all I want to show you on this screen. So let's go down to the next screen here. Okay, so I clicked on the resident impact and facility capacity pathway. Okay, so this is the first pathway. This pathway focuses on the impact of COVID-19 on residents, on facility capacity, and availability of COVID-19 testing for residents. This pathway has a total of nine questions that are divided into two sections. You can see at the top, there are resident impact count questions, and then at the bottom is facility capacity and laboratory testing. Again, as you can see at the top, the date for which responses are reported is auto-populated based on the selection in, in the calendar, and I selected May 8th. I do want to point out that this pathway is unique compared to the rest of the pathways because you'll notice if you look down here at the bottom next to testing, you'll see that red asterisk. What that means is that this pathway does have a required question that must be answered in order to save the pathway. This is the only pathway that is like that. So, um, we, let's see, I think on the next slide, yeah, so on the next slide, we're gonna talk about that. So this is what your pathway looks like for resident impact and facility capacity. So the first is your resident impact. You can see these are boxes, which mean they're counts. The second part is asking about your facility capacity. So your all beds, your current census and testing. Again, I just wanna mention that each pathway has its own data collection form, as well as set of instructions that we encourage users to use, until, especially until you get used to the meaning of each question. There are a total of five questions, as I mentioned in the first, in the first section, all of which are counts. It is important to enter a response, even if the response is zero. So I'm gonna repeat this. Even if the response is zero, you must enter a response. If you leave it, if you leave a count box blank, 
that means that you did not enter data. That means it is incomplete, and that is how CMS will interpret a blank box. So if you mean to report zero, make sure you enter a zero in the box. Very important, okay? So as I mentioned earlier, when responding to data elements that require counts, such as what you're seeing here under your resident impact, you're only going to enter the new counts since the last time counts were entered for that particular data element. Or if this is the first time you're reporting, you're going to enter the number of cases for that for this week. So since we're pretending in this session that this is the first time I'm reporting data into this module on May 8th, I am going to enter counts, all new counts since May 1st. So for that week, I'm entering all new counts. For the first one, admissions, you can see here, admissions for this module is defined as residents newly admitted or readmitted to the long-term care facility from a hospital where they were treated for suspected or laboratory positive COVID-19 since the last date admission counts were entered or the new counts for this week if this is the first time reporting. So today is my first time reporting, so I'm gonna enter all newly admitted residents since May 1st all the way to May, May 8th, right? If I report again on May 10th, I will only enter the new residents from May 8th to May 10th. But today I will enter um, from May 1st to May 8th since it's my first time reporting. The next definition in count data is confirmed. NHSN defines confirmed as the number of residents who have newly identified as having a laboratory positive COVID-19. Again, since the last date confirmed 19 counts were entered into the module or this week, the new counts for this week, if this is the first time I'm reporting these confirmed counts. Counts will include residents who remain in the long-term care facility, as well as residents who were transferred out of the facility, admitted to another facility, or died. And this is another example of why it is important to do your counts every day at the same time. Let's say Mr. Smith had a confirmed positive on May 1st at 9 a.m., I counted him. Let's say, at 12 p.m., Mr. Smith was transferred to another facility. He's still included in my count, right? Because at 9 a.m., he was in my facility, and that's when I did my count. So that's why it's important that you do your counts at the same time, if possible. Next, I want to talk about suspected. Suspected is defined as residents newly managed as though they have COVID-19, because they have signs and or symptoms suggestive of COVID-19, but do not test positive, do not have a positive laboratory COVID-19 test result. This could be because a test, not, a test has not been performed or a test is pending. It could also be that the resident had a negative test but that resident is still highly suspicious as being positive because of the signs and symptoms that he or she is displaying. Again, this count for suspected does include residents who remain in the facility at the time of your count, as well as residents who were transferred out of the facility, admitted to another facility, or died after your count. Okay, going down the list, the next question is asking about total deaths. Total deaths is defined as residents who died for any reason in the long-term care facility or in another location since the last time total death counts were entered into the module, or if this is the first time you're entering total death counts, you're going to enter the counts for this week only. You will include count deaths for any reason, which will likely include COVID-19 related deaths and non-COVID-19 related deaths. Next, COVID-19 death count is defined as number of new deaths 
for residents with suspected and laboratory positive COVID-19 since the last date COVID-19 death counts were entered or this week if it's the first time reporting. You will include residents who died in your long-term care facility or in another location. Next, I will review the final section of the resident impact and facility capacity pathway. All beds that is defined as the total number of licensed resident beds in the facility. Once you enter your bed count, this bed count will save and pre-populate on future dates. So you only have to enter it once unless your licensed bed count changes and then you would need to change it, but otherwise don't change it. Current census on the date you are reporting your responses, so that would be May 8th for us, right? We're reporting on May 8th. On May 8th, the day that you're reporting the data into the module, enter the total number of residents that are occupying a bed in, a, in, in your facility. So this is really important that you do not get current census confused with all beds. All beds will likely not change because all beds is based on the number of licensed beds that you're licensed to operate in your facility, period. The current census is based on today. Today, the date you're entering data. So today that I'm entering data in this example is May 8th, how many residents are occupying a bed in my facility today? It does not include bed holds. It includes how many residents are in my facility today. Now, I've heard from some long-term care facilities that it's possible that the census, current census, could exceed the actual number of licensed bed counts because some long-term care facilities are having to bring in additional beds to to um, to to um, handle the surge or they're having to move residents to other floors in which or other units in which they aren't licensed for so that is okay we don't want you to change the bed count that you're licensed for instead we want you to identify those surge, the, the surge capacity in beds in your current census on the day you are reporting. Next, testing is a yes or no type question that is required to be answered. On the date responses are being entered into the module, does your facility have access to COVID-19 testing that can be performed while the resident remains in the facility? That is important. If you're sending your resident out of, the, out of the facility for testing, then that would be a no for that answer. But if you have available testing that can be done while the resident is in-house, then you answer yes. This is another question that will remain the same answer once you answer it once. It stays the same for all future entries unless you change it. You, you do have the ability to change it. If you answer no, then you're done with this page and you can save it. If you answer yes, then you do need to answer what laboratory type uh, you use for testing. Where are these uh, swabs or specimens sent for testing? You, your options are the state health department, private labs such as a hospital, corporation, academic institution. If neither of those are applicable, select other. You may select more than one here. And remember, testing must be answered in order to save this pathway. If you do not answer this and you save, you're gonna get a pop-up message that says you must answer. And then if you click cancel, it's going to delete all of the data you've entered. So you don't wanna click cancel. Okay, so be sure that you click save. So this is what a complete pathway looks like for the resident impact and facility capacity pathway. You can see I answered all the questions. Again, remember for the top section, the counts, if the count is zero, do not leave it blank, enter a zero. Okay, and once I've entered, I'm going to click save so I can show you what it looks like. Once you click save, you go to this calendar view here and you'll receive a message that says successfully saved the record. 
and then you're going to see your record that you just completed is either going to be green or it's going to be the tan color. Tan means you've, you left one or more questions unanswered. Green means you've answered all of the questions. And if for some reason it comes up tan, then you can just click back into that record and, and answer the question if, if you accidentally overlooked a question. Very easy to edit. The next pathway I will, I will be reviewing is the staff and personnel impact pathway. This pathway focuses on the impact of COVID-19 on staff and facility personnel, including staffing shortages. The pathway, as you can see on this screen, includes a total of seven questions with three requiring counts and the remainder being yes or no type answers. NHSN defines staff and facility personnel as anyone working or volunteering in the facility, which includes, but is not limited to, contractors, full-time, part-time employees, as needed employees are referred to as PRN staff, temporary staff, resident caregivers, shared staff. So let's say you're a phlebotomist who you maybe share between the skilled nursing facility and the hospital, for example. That person is considered yours if that person becomes suspected or confirmed or died. That person would still be included in your counts. Okay, let's just take a deep dive. Um, as you know by now, um, I sound like a broken record, uh, we do have the data collection forms and instructions for you. And let's take a look. So I, I split this up into sections so it, it makes it easier for you to see on the screen. So the first three questions in the staff and personal impact pathway assess suspected and confirmed COVID-19 related morbidity and mortality among your staff and facility personnel. Just like the other count data discussed, these questions require new counts only since the last time that count was entered into the module for this specific question, right? Or if it's the first time your facility is entering counts under this pathway, it will be the new counts for, for the week, okay? Confirmed is is defined as staff and facility personnel newly identified with a laboratory positive COVID-19 test results since the last date confirmed counts were entered into the module. So since for this training, we're saying that this is May 8th is the first day we started entering data, I'm going to include all of my confirmed uh, lab positive COVID-19 test results, all my staff who have lab positive COVID-19 test results from May 1st to May 8th, okay? Let's fast forward to May 15th. On May 15th, when I log in to report, I will only include any new staff or facility personnel who were newly identified as having a positive COVID-19 since I reported from May 8th. So it'd be from May 8th, whatever time I did my counts, to May 15th, whatever time I did my counts. Remember, we're not, you do not want to report duplicates. You do not want to make it look like you have more cases than you have. So you're only including those new cases each time you report. Going down to suspected. Suspected is defined as staff and facility personnel being newly managed as though they have COVID-19 since the last date the suspected counts were entered into the module. So again, these are your staff who have signs and symptoms that are suggestive of COVID-19, but have not had a positive lab result. So maybe their lab test is pending or they have not had a test completed yet. And then the last count box on this page is COVID-19 deaths. And this is defined as new deaths, deaths for staff and facility personnel with suspected as well as those with laboratory positive COVID-19 Okay, since the last date that the COVID-19 death count for staff and facility personnel were entered. Okay, go into the next section 
of the Staff and Personnel Impact Pathway. This section focuses on staffing shortages and the responses are based on yes or no. And anytime you have yes, no type questions, those responses are based on the date you are answering them. So we're pretending May 8th is the date we're completing this survey. So on May 8th today, let's say today's May 8th, I'm going down the list. Do I have any, any staffing shortages in nursing staff, including registered nurses, licensed, licensed practical nurses, vocational nurse, yes or no? Clinical staff, including physicians, physician assistant, advanced practice nurses, aides, certified nursing assistants, nursing aides, medication aides, medication technicians, or any other staff or facility not listed above. So you will identify staffing shortages on this day, the day you're answering the responses. And NHSN does not provide a lot of guidance as far as what's considered a staffing shortage. We ask that your responses be based on your individual facility needs and internal policies for staffing ratios. Here is an example of a survey that has been answered for the staff and personnel impact pathway. So I've answered all of the questions. You'll notice that Pierre at the top for COVID-19 deaths, I had zero deaths, so I actually entered a zero. Remember, a blank count equals incomplete data. So I, enter, I entered a zero. So once you were done, you could, if you, if you still wanted to complete the entire four modules, I could just skip over and click on supplies and personnel and continue entering data and each each module would save in between my selections. But if I wanted to take a break, go get coffee, go eat lunch, then I would go to the bottom, click save. When I click save, I will receive this message that my record has saved. And then I will notice on May 8th that is green, meaning that I answered all questions for that pathway. The third pathway is the supplies and personnel, personal protective equipment pathway or PPE. And this pathway assesses the availability of personal protective equipment and, and hand hygiene in the facility. There are two columns for each of the six supply items listed. Each response is a yes or no, and it's based on the current availability of supplies. So today, today, the day I'm entering these data, May 8th, do I have any? The next column, based on May 8th, do I have enough for one week? Okay, so you will go down each of these rows here, N95 mask, today, today that May, on May 8th, do I have any N95 mask? Yes or no? The next column, do I have enough for one week? Next, surgical mask, do I have any? And, and what we're speaking about when we're saying any, that means any for your, for your staff to use. The, so we're trying to identify if you have a shortage in your facility. Once you've completed the yes or no, you go to the bottom and you click save. Or again, you could go to the next pathway if you wanted to, but let's click save. And we're gonna save. And then you'll notice I get my pop-up message that says successfully saved and then my supplies has been answered for May 8th and I completed it because it's showing me that it's green. Next. The last, the fourth and the final pathway is the ventilator capacity and supplies pathway. This pathway assesses ventilator capacity and supplies for the long-term care facilities, specifically with ventilator-dependent units and or ventilator beds. This is an update. So if, if you listen to an earlier presentation, the answer um, previously only included 
dependent units. However, I received some feedback from some of our skilled nursing facilities telling me that we don't have ventilator specific units, but because of COVID-19, we do have ventilator dependent beds now. So if your facility has ven ventilator dependent units and or ventilator dependent beds, then you will answer yes. And again, this is based on the day you were answering the survey, just like all yes, no. So on May 8th, do I have ventilator dependent units and or beds in my facility? Your response to this question, the very first time you answer it, will remain for any other time you log in. So if I answer no to this question, I won't have to ever come back to this module again because this answer will stay no every time I log in and I can skip this fourth pathway. If I answer, answer yes, then I will need, so the remainder of the form will populate and I will need to answer those questions. And again, if, if you answer yes or no, and in the future, the answer changes, you do have the ability to make edits. Data collection forms, I'm going to skip past because by now I think you all know we have data collection forms and instructions. Okay, so let's pretend for, for our sake that we do have ventilator dependent beds in our facility. The first section, and, and I answered yes, so the rest of the page populated for me. So the first section asks me two count questions. It's asking me mechanical ventilators, which is defined as the number of mechanical ventilators do I have in the facility? So on today, May 8th, how many mechanical ventilators do I have in my facility? And this does include ventilators that are in use as well as not in use. It also includes uh, ventilators that um, you can transport. The next one, mechanical ventilators in use, is defined as number today, on the day I'm answering this survey, what is the number of mechanical ventilators that I have in use for residents who have su suspected or confirmed COVID-19? Okay. Then we're going to go down to the final section, which refers to supplies. And this is one question divided into two columns, yes or no. And so again, because it is a yes or no question, it is based on today, again, today, do I have any ventilator supplies needed to care for these ventilator residents, yes or no. The next column, do I have enough for one week, yes or no. And this, this question is an all or none. So basically, if you have everything you need, that means yes. If you're missing one thing, if you're missing a flow sensor or a connector or a valve, then it's no, it's all or none, okay? So this is what it looks like, the complete pathway. I have answered everything, and then I click Save. And now I can see for May 8th that I have completed all four pathways, and they're all complete because they're all green, right? So what is wrong with this picture? So here... If you look at May 7th, my resident impact pathway, my resident impact and facility capacity pathway is color coded as tan. And remember tan, if you look at the top box up here, means that on May 7th, I started entering data for this pathway, but I, and I saved it, but I did not enter all of the data. This could be intentional because maybe when I started entering data, I didn't have everything I needed and I plan on going back and entering it later, which is perfectly fine. You can do that. That's your right. Or I just got tired or my shift ended and I just wanted to go ahead and enter what I knew at the moment. That's fine. So now I want to edit this. All I have to do is click inside the pathway on resident. And when I do that, you see on this left-hand side here, the pop-up box comes up that, that shows, again, at the top, all of the pathways, but it comes up to the pathway that I clicked, 
which was my resident impact and facility capacity. And you can see here, I left a box blank because I forgot that Dr. Antilla told me that if we had zero deaths, I had to actually enter zero deaths. So now I remember, so I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna enter my zero because thank goodness we had zero deaths reported for that week or the last time I entered data from that date. And so I went ahead and I entered my zero and then I save it and bam, it comes up as green, which means it's complete. And I'm super excited. Okay. Whew, that was a lot of work. You guys need to just take a deep breath. We got through all four pathways. And now I'm going to just give you some takeaways and some reminders. And these are things that I really want you to remember, okay? So I'm gonna just give you just a minute to take a couple deep breaths and get ready. We have about 20 more slides to go, but these won't be, these won't take as much brain power, okay? So the first thing I wanna remind you is that for the best internet experience with NHSN, you need to have an update internet browser. And we do recommend Internet Explorer, the latest version, but it's not required. I think in my, in a previous, my earlier training, I said it was required and the, our techies told me, nope, you're wrong, it's not required. So it's not required, but it is recommended. Um, you can also use the latest version of Microsoft Edge, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Um, <clears throat> those are the recommended ones. If you have other browsers or older versions um, of the, these recommended browsers, eh, the pathway may or may not work for you. The application may or may not work because some features may be incompatible. So please review, I think I have a link. Yeah, I do have a link at the bottom of the page. Review that if it makes sense to you, you are super technical technology smart because half of that does not make a lot of sense to me but um, if you have a technology person in your facility um, who could help you with that um, I would pull them in if you have any questions and we do have technology experts um, in our group so if you have any questions about your browser or if you need help updating your browser please let us know and we will help you do that. It probably will not be me helping you do that, but it will be one of our technology experts. So the next thing I just wanted to remind you, which I think you could probably, you're gonna dream about this, is that data elements consist of counts and yes or no responses, right? The responses to the yes, or no questions are based on the date you are answering those responses, right? Whereas there's some different rules for the count data, but the yes or no's are based on the date you're actually sitting in front of that computer entering that data. For your counts, remember this is, this is, is an update that we've already talked about, but I just wanna repeat it again because it's very, very important so that you are submitting the most accurate data possible. The first time that a long-term care facility enters counts into the long-term care facility COVID-19 module, unless otherwise specified in the instructions, the counts for each question must include the number of new counts for that week. And I interpret that week as the previous seven days, but not, not to go before May 1st. So for example, if you're reporting first on May 8th, like I did in my example, I would include all the way back to May 1st. Do not include anything prior to May 1st for your first set of counts because that's considered retrospective data. And, and we've already talked about how you will enter that. Okay, so your counts, again, include your admissions for previously treated COVID-19 residents, your suspected and confirmed COVID-19 for residents and staff, your total deaths, your COVID-19 deaths. Those are just some examples of counts. Again, we talked about this, but a facility may enter aggregate, which means total, retrospective, which means back data, older data, from January 1st, 2020, all the way to April 30th, 2020. But remember, in order to submit these counts, you must select a date on the calendar prior to May 1st, 
Okay, so hit that back button if you have to. You can submit on April 30th if you want, but just don't submit those old counts in May. So select a date prior to May. And if you have a lot of time on your hands, which I doubt any of you do, but if you wanted to submit these by month, you could, but you are certainly not required. And in fact, entering these aggregate retrospective data is completely optional, but it is encouraged so that we get an idea of what you all have gone through since January up until April before this module was available. Okay, again, very, very important. If your answer is zero, be sure that you enter zero. A blank data element, meaning a blank response, equals missing data. And this is really important for those of you who have CMS mandates. You do not want to leave anything blank. Okay, for suspected, this was an update um, in earlier from earlier training where we did not we did not require suspected to have signs and symptoms. We received a lot of questions about this from facilities who uh, maybe, put, maybe put all residents on isolation initially, even though they're not really suspected, but they do that to rule out infection. So that's why we updated the, the definition for suspected to include residents without a positive lab test but they're being managed as though they have COVID-19 because they have signs and or symptoms in accordance with the CDC's guidelines for the evaluation of persons under investigation. And if you look at the instructions for this form, there's actually a hyperlink that takes you to the CDC's um, webpage that gives you those signs and symptoms, okay? Um, this may include residents who have not been tested at all, um, because we know that it is hard to stick a long skinny q-tip up an older person's nose especially an older person with dementia who may think you're trying to kill them um, it may also include negative results because again we know that it is difficult to get that q-tip up there and in a resident who is confused and really doesn't understand why you are attacking him or her with some kind of device that looks like it came from ours. We understand that, and we know that if you don't get a good swab, it's probably gonna be negative, even though the resident could very well be positive. So if you get a negative result, but that resident does have those signs and symptoms, you can include the resident as a suspected. And then if the resident is, is, is meets the above, definitions and is in your facility on the day you do your counts, include that resident in your count, even if the resident later gets transferred out of the facility or dies, okay? So don't remove the resident from the counts if the resident is no longer in your facility on the day you're reporting. It's based on the day you collected the counts, okay? So remember counts every day at the same time, you're going to try to get those counts, okay? And then, then enter them at the end of the week or whatever day you choose to enter the counts. Uh, another takeaway I wanted to give you is just to remind you that the definition for a ventilator dependent unit now includes facilities that have ventilator dependent units and or beds. So this is a little different from the initial presentation, just so give you an update. And now I want to give you an example. So if your head hasn't started spinning by now, it's really going to start spinning now because we're going to do an example, okay? And I'm going to try to not get myself confused with this example. Um, okay, so DHQP, skilled nursing facility, this is a fake nursing facility, by the way, um, is a 125-bed facility that recently completed NHSN enrollment into the long-term care facility COVID-19 module. Ms. B is the NHSN facility administrator who will be entering the data into the NHSN long-term care facility COVID module. Her, her, organiz her organization determined responses will be entered every Friday beginning on May 8th. The facility has been using the NHSN data collection forms to collect counts every morning at 10 a.m. since May 1st. Okay, remember these collection forms are on the COVID-19 website, which was shown on previous slides if you forgot. 
from May 1st at 10 a.m. all the way to 10 a.m. on May 8th, this, this facility had the following new counts. So pri since prior to May 1st, the facility had 10 admission slash readmissions of residents previously hospitalized and treated for COVID-19. They also had 21 lab positive COVID-19 residents, 13 residents with signs and symptoms suggested of COVID-19, nine deaths among residents, and seven COVID-19 deaths among residents. So on Friday, May 8th, Miss B gets her coffee and she sits down in front of the computer and she's ready to log in. So she logs in to NHSN, long-term care facility, COVID-19, that's not supposed to be COVID-10, uh, COVID-19 module, if someone on my team can remind me to fix that on my slide. Um, so the COVID-19 module, and she reports the responses in the resident impact and facility capacity pathway, because she doesn't really have a lot of time to complete all of the pathways right now. So when she logs in, remember she goes to the left side of that navigation panel um, on her NHSN home screen. Once she clicks the COVID-19, she comes to this calendar. You can see this calendar's blank, right? Because this is the very first time that any data is being reported into this module, okay? So at the very top, you can see um, the dates, um, some instructions, so let's click on May 8th. All right, so this is, these are the data that Miss B has entered. You can see at the top, because she selected May 8th on the calendar, that date pre-populated at the very top up here, she selected the resident impact and facility capacity pathway because that's what she had the data for right now, and she entered the numbers that she had on her forms. She entered her bed count. Now, the tricky part about this is that, um, oh no, actually this isn't the tricky part because she's answering, answering based on the day. I got myself confused. So today on May 8th, she answered yes, because today on May 8th, her facility does perform in-house COVID-19 testing on residents. And they submit these specimens to the state health department, okay? So again, she all of these counts are new counts for this week since it's the first time she's been reporting. All beds includes all of the licensed beds in her facility, which may not, it's likely not to change in future submissions, but her census is based on today, how many of those beds are occupied. And remember, the census can change and will change. And it is possible that your current census will exceed your licensed bed count if you get a, a surge capacity. Okay, so she en enters everything and she clicks save. And she's super excited to see that everything saved successfully and she gets a green for resident, okay? That means she answered all of her questions. After entering responses in, in the, the, the resident impact and facility capacity pathway, Ms. B decided that she wanted to document the morbidity and mortality COVID-19 had on her long-term care facility before the NHSN long-term care facility COVID-19 module was available for reporting. So she has those counts available. Since she knows, because she listened to Dr. Antilla's training, she knows that she must select a reporting date prior to May 1st to enter the, the retrospective, also referred to as the, the older data um, on the calendar. So she uses that arrow back button at the top of the calendar and she selects another date. And this is what she's going to report, the facility has the following retrospective counts from January 1st to April 30th. Many of you may not have these counts until maybe March is what I'm, I'm hearing, like March to April, and that's okay. If you didn't have any in January or February, that is okay. Just enter what you have. It doesn't, it, it, we're not asking this to be perfect. We're not asking you to do a lot of digging. We're just asking entering, enter what you know, even if you're not completing the entire 
count record. Just enter what you know. So she does know that she had 200 positive lab positive residents during this time period from January 1st to April 30th. She also knows that she had 10 lab positive staff. She had zero staff death, thank goodness, related to COVID-19. She had 75 total resident deaths and, and then 59 COVID-19 related resident deaths. So remember, these are her aggregate counts from January 1st to April 30th. So these are her old counts before the module. So she goes to her calendar and she's going to select on a date before May May 1st. So if she had to, she could go up to the top left hand corner and select the back button where it's circled here by the calendar. But because May 30th is showing, since this calendar shows, uh, you know, shows a expansive time period, she clicks on May 30th. She opens up the resident impact and facility pathway and she enters the counts from January 1st to April 30th, 2020. And these are the counts that she knows. So she knew that she had 200 confirmed residents with lab positive COVID. She knew that she had 75 total deaths, which include COVID and non-COVID related deaths. And she knew that she had 59 COVID-19 specific deaths that occurred either in her facility or in another location. Now, she does not know the admissions. She does not know the suspected. Perfectly fine. That's okay because this is not required. She does not know what the bed count was back then. It probably is the same that it is now, 125, but she's not 100% certain. So she leaves it blank. She did not know what the census was. So remember, census is based on the date you were reporting into the module. See, look at the very top. She's reporting on April 30th right? She doesn't remember the census for April 30th, so she's going to leave it blank, and that's okay. The only thing that she does have to remember, because it is required only in this one module, is she has to remember if she did testing, if, if the facility had testing during that time period for residents, in-house testing, meaning the testing was done, performed on the residents while they were in the facility. And so she looks back in her records and she realizes, no, we did not have testing during that time. So she selects no, and she's done, okay? And she will save her record, okay? She's gonna get a message that says, your record was saved successfully. Remember, you're always gonna get this message that says saved successfully, even if it's incomplete, because it's just verifying that yes, NHSN is saved what you entered, okay? But you notice up here, because she entered on April 30th, it does show as an incomplete record because she did not enter all of the, of the data because she didn't know it, and that's okay. There's no requirement to enter the retrospective count data, so you're not gonna be penalized for that, and you're not expected to do a lot of work and digging to find those data. So that's okay that that April 30th is showing as incomplete. What's important is she was able to enter the data that she knew, right, from January 1st to April 30th, and she entered that. If at any time she comes across more data for that older time period, she can always go back and edit and add additional data, okay? Uh, okay, so this is showing a duplicate. Okay. Um, Let's see what I'm trying to get at here. Oh, okay, this is, okay. So Mrs. B, I, um, I remember now, she also wanted to report some of the morbidity data that impacted her staff and personnel from COVID-19, okay? So again, she can, uh, she could have clicked directly from that resident impact and facility pathway tab directly to the staff and personnel impact, or she could have saved that tab and then re-entered the calendar. Either way is fine, but she selected, she, she saved, and then she re-entered the calendar. You can see at the very top up here for, for the same date, um, April 30th, she clicked, it, clicked on the staff 
and personnel impact, and she entered what she knew from the counts from January 1st, 2020 until April 30th. And what she knew was that she had 10 staff and facility personnel who tested positive for COVID-19. And she had did not have any deaths, so she entered zero. We had no deaths. So she didn't leave it blank because she knew they had no deaths, so she entered zero. Now, these bottom questions here, so remember most of your yes, no questions are based on your response on the day you're entering data. So since she is entering data for April 30th, she doesn't remember the staffing shortages. Who would remember that? We're not expecting anybody to remember that. So she's gonna leave those blank. And that again is perfectly okay because all she's trying to do is let us and, and everyone else know, hey, this is how COVID-19 impacted our facility before anybody knew about it impacting our facility. So she enters what she knows and she clicks save. And again, you can see here that she gets the, the record is saved successfully to confirm that her answers are saved. And again, it's gonna show under the staff, um, you know, under, under that particular module, it will show as incomplete, but that's okay because this is retrospective data and we're just asking uh, Mrs. B to answer what she knows as far as count data only, okay? So, that, so, so that's okay. Um, so we're almost done. We have just a few more slides. I just wanna go through a, a, a few of the common questions that have come through our box that may be helpful to you. How do I contact CMS with questions about reporting mandates? I have on here a, a, actually um, an email for you where you can send your questions directly to CMS enforcement and, um, and they will respond to you. So I'm gonna give you just a minute to write that down. It's a DNH and a, there's an underscore there, which you can't see, enforcement at cms.hhs.gov. And again, there, there is a copy of these slides on our website already. It's, I had made, for this training, I made some revisions, um, but nothing drastic, there's no, there's nothing incorrect, I'll say, on the slides that are posted. Um, so, the, so this information is already on our website in my training slides. Can one NHSN facility administrator enroll, be, be enrolled and submit data for multiple facilities? Absolutely, yes. Does all beds include all beds in a combined facility where there are assisted living facility and skilled nursing facility beds together? So as a reminder, all beds must include the licensed beds for that particular facility type. As a reminder, you do not want to enroll your skilled nursing facility with your assisted living facility. You want to enroll those as two different facility types. The reason is, is first, assisted living facilities are not required to report to CMS. So why would you want to inflate your numbers in your SNF data? You don't wanna do that, okay? I, but I do still encourage you to go ahead and enroll your assisted living facilities because we do know that many of these facilities are being impacted and you deserve to be recognized for, your, and for the impact that it is having on your facilities, your staff, and your population, your resident population. So we do encourage you to enroll, but you must enroll independently, okay? And that means the bed count would be separate for each. Okay, here are some additional resources um, for you. And I would like to thank all of you for your time today.